Hello. The IMF is launching its new Spring 2015 Global Financial Stability Report, looking at trends in global financial markets. To discuss the main conclusions of the report, here's Jose Vinales, Financial Counselor and Director of the IMF's Monetary and Capital Markets. Hello, Jose. Hello. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. So, this seems to be a very complicated uh, period in, in financial markets, not that it's easy anyway. But uh, what are the main uh, findings of this new report? Well, in a nutshell, um, what we find is that at this stage, so many years since the beginning of the crisis, financial stability is not yet assured. In fact, what we have seen is that over the past six months, there's been an increase in risks to financial stability, and also we've seen a rotation to places where these risks are harder to monitor and harder to address. For example, risks have shifted from banks to non-banks, or if you prefer, shadow banks, from solvency towards market liquidity, and from advanced economies to emerging markets. And more specifically, what are these risks? Well, I think there are four main risks to global financial stability. The first one, uh, are the risks that come from a period, long period, of very low interest rates, negative interest rates now in a number of cases, which are leading in some advanced economies to pockets of financial uh, excesses, of pockets of overvaluation of asset prices, and also creating solvency challenges for life insurance companies and defined benefits pension funds. The second uh, risk is that of the normalization of uh, U.S. monetary policy and the risk that it can be bumpier than we would all uh, uh, hope for. The third risk has to do with emerging markets and emerging markets groups, economies which are very heterogeneous. And what I would highlight is that they are emerging market economies which are more vulnerable in so far as they are, for example, oil or commodity exporters, and they have been hit by lower uh, oil and commodity prices, as they have higher corporate uh, debt, and a lot of it may be in foreign currency and in hedge, and may be hit by higher interest rates coming from the United States and a stronger dollar. So all of these uh, risks are important, but I would like to add one more risk, which is that related to political or geopolitical risks having to do with Ukraine, with Russia, risks in the Middle East, in other parts of the world. And if any of these risks materializes in the present context of low market liquidity, the impact of uh, those shocks is going to be deeper, is going to be amplified, and is going to be extended well beyond the markets or countries which will initially be hit by the shocks. So these are the main risks to global financial stability. So you mentioned this liquidity issue and it, this seems to be a pervasive issue throughout the report. Tell us more about this problem and particularly how can we have a liquidity problem after all these years in which the largest central banks have been pouring money into the financial system through the various quantitative easing uh, programs, probably trillions of dollars. So where has all this money gone? Well, there, there is an apparent paradox that you can have an abundance of what I could call monetary liquidity and at the same time you may have an insufficiency of market liquidity which refers to the depth of financial markets and for example if you look at fixed income markets today what you can see is that liquidity is quite good in good times but when you ask the question will liquidity be there in bad times where there is stress and then people want to sell, it is not so clear that liquidity will be there. In fact, liquidity may well evaporate from markets because there may not be enough counterparties which are there in order to accommodate this desire to sell of other people. So there may be many people trying to run towards the exit door while the exit door is too narrow. And that means that liquidity may vanish and this will amplify very much the impact on asset prices, particularly on bond prices, on exchange rates, of the materialization of some of these uh, shocks that make people to sell. And as I was mentioning a few uh, minutes ago, this will lead to a much 
a larger impact and much more extended impact, which go well beyond the market, which is hit by the shock in the first place. So when we talk about um, quantitative easing program, of course, the, the ECB's program comes to mind, which is the most recent and, and commented one. What is your first evaluation of it? Is it, is it has it been working? Well, quantitative easing is absolutely of the essence for the euro area because uh, it is essential to address the deflation risks that, that existed. So it's very important. The question is, is it working? That's what you're asking. And uh, one can say that the answer is yes if one looks at the impact that it's having on asset prices. In fact, quantitative easing is uh, working well before uh, its implementation in March of this month. It's been working for months before, once markets have had some expectation that this program was going to be launched. And one can see a very significant reduction in borrowing costs, very significant increase in equity prices, uh, a depreciation of the euro, and all of these things are enhancing asset valuations in the euro area, are decreasing the cost of financing, are improving the competitiveness of European firms, and all of this is hopefully going to lead to better prospects down the road. But in addition to this channel working through asset prices, it's also very important in the euro area, the so-called bank credit channel, because the euro area is very much reliant on bank credit to finance economic activity. And there what we can see is that even before quantitative easing being launched in March, there has been some recovery of credit to the private sector, of credit growth, but this is still very limited. And one needs to accelerate the recovery of credit, which otherwise will take quite a bit of time. And one very important factor for that is to make sure that banks are in the best possible position to lend. And all the things equal, what we see is that banks that have higher non-performing loans are less inclined to lend. And in the euro area banking system, you have about 900 billion of uh, euros in non-performing loans, which are sitting in banks' balance sheets. So it will be very important to manage these non-performing assets in order to unclog further the credit supply uh, channel so that it can meet the recovery in credit demand as it takes place. So when we put all these together, indebted companies, fragile banks, ri high risk in the markets, what needs to be done? What should countries do? I think there are two type of actions which are key now. One is to maximize the traction of monetary policies so that they can fully achieve their goals. And that goes for countries doing quantitative easing so that all the policies accompany monetary policies, so that monetary policies are not the only game in town. And it also goes for those in the exiting mode, like the United States, which needs to manage well the normalization of monetary policies. And second, one needs to enhance financial resilience. And that goes both for advanced economies and also for emerging markets. They face different challenges, but in both of them, enhancing the resilience of the financial system is important in light of the potential shocks that may hit them. Thank you very much. You're welcome.